All right, here's the voice. Here is recording, so there we go. Well, friends, what is the greatest enemy of all humankind? People probably say economic troubles, wars, and all kind of things. Well, yes, sure, but nevertheless, the greatest enemy of humankind is death. What is the greatest promise that we have in the Holy Scriptures? Is the victory over death. Do you ever think that having eternal life, is it that not the victory over death? All death will be devoured by life. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So therefore, there is a plan that God has devised. That plan, of course, is being obvious through the holy holidays that God has commanded us to keep, so that we always know and always keep in mind His plan of salvation of humankind. All right, let me just summarize that plan for you. It's uh, the first fruits of, of, of being called now. So right now, God has called to salvation on a few that he has chosen for his future government and uh, those to be kings and priests in the world to come. So it's only a few now. They are also qualifying for their positions in the kingdom of God. So, the first fruits first. Before all of us, of course, came who else but Jesus Christ. He had to die and he had to come back to life. And that's why we made all their book because they come up uh, Elijah and Elijah and, 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 um, and Enoch, who supposedly, according to the wrong Protestant interpretation, supposedly they just, you know, they just, uh, they, 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 they did not die. They, they just went to heaven and they're just alive or whatever. Friends, that's a Protestant wrong thing because that would mean that would mean that an Enoch and Elijah would be our saviors and not Jesus Christ. In John chapter three, uh, you don't have to go there. I just want to remind you, John chapter three, in his dialogue with Nicodemus, Jesus Christ says, "Nobody has ascended to heaven except for the one who came down from heaven. That's only him. If it's nobody, then it is nobody." Which means that Elijah and Enoch did not go to heaven, contrary to what. The Protestant world believes, and probably the rest of the world, because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, other, because if they went to heaven, if they went to God before Jesus Christ, who is now at the right hand of God, then that means that Enoch and Elijah would be our saviors, and it's not. That's not the case. There is only one name under the heaven by which we might be saved, and it's called the name is of Jesus Christ. And therefore, there are so many wrong things in this world that we have to unlearn, reject, explain, and we will do that. Because the hope of Israel is not like all these other churches, oh, they all preach from the Bible. No, other churches, basically, I mean churches in the world, they preach the twisted doctrines, their twisted understanding of the doctrines of the Bible. The, 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 the Church of God in general, because it's a spiritual organism, the Church of God in general preaches the right true doctrines of the Bible, how they're to be how they're to be understood. And now we have the resurrections. The resurrections from dead meaning that will be victory over death. So the first one in the first resurrection, which is called the better resurrection in the book of Revelation, it is reserved for those who die in the true faith now, in this day and age. Or those who are alive and they will be alive when Jesus Christ comes, they'll be transformed into spirit body and that means they'll be born, then they'll be born again of the Spirit, just like Jesus described to Nicodemus. What is of flesh is born of flesh. What is of spirit is born of spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit at baptism, friends, so that we can grow in grace and knowledge, that we can grow spiritually and develop. And then the time for our birth will come when Jesus Christ is coming down to this earth again. That is the time when we'll be born again. Some will be transformed into the spirit body and some will rise from the dead in a spirit body. Not in physical body, but in spirit body. That's being born again. And that is exactly the, uh, uh, that's the first resurrection. Then all those who have never called in their lifetime, in all these past ages, including billions of babies that were aborted, or simply something happened so they could not be born. Billions of those people, including all those babies, will come back to life in the second resurrection, which is described in Ezekiel chapters uh, 37 and 36. 
and all humanity that was not called by God in all these past ages will come back to life. Why? They will come back to life just like to be subjected to what, friends? Subjected to what? I want you to have this vision because this vision is crucial. Friends, God has been trying all along to do something and that is to restore his government upon this earth. He tried with the angels, it failed. He wanted to do it through Adam and Eve, it failed because of their rebellion. And he is now doing that through us. Because through his first fruits, through those who come in the first resurrection and become kings and priests, what will they be administering to this earth, brethren? Well, obviously God's law. What else could they administer anyway? Just like any kingdom. Kingdom comprised, comprised of the laws, subjects, the king, and, have a, and territory. We have the territories, the earth. Subjects will be all humanity. The king, of course, king of kings and lord of lords, who is one with his father, will be the king. And uh, the laws is there. The laws of God, which are all, always keep in mind, the essence of the laws of God is love. Some people feel as if God gave us laws to limit us in something or, 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 or limit our enjoyment and our pleasure in this life. No, brethren. He gave us his law to keep us and protect us from the evil forces of this world. Keep in mind Satan is there. And who and what is Satan will be another subject of our of these our main doctrines because people too often forget that we live in the present evil world and too often people forget how powerful Satan is. And how powerful he can manipulate with us because we all have one diagnosis which is written in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can understand it you see that's our diagnosis brethren that's why the hope of Israel church the worldwide church of God is also big huge hospital spiritual hospital in which we're being healed Healed from wrong and ill doctrines, healed from wrong and ill ideas, healed from ideologies, wrong and ill ideologies, etc., etc. Healed, we are being healed from all that we have imbibed from this evil world. And there is so much that we did, sadly, that sometimes we do not understand. So the feedback, as I mentioned, and I mentioned before the, this message, and I'm going to say it now publicly, the feedback that we have, oh, there are things and teachings in the book that we did not expect good it's good that you did not expect it just shows to you that the christian life and christian understanding is far deeper and far more extant than just merely keeping the holidays and keeping the sabbath yes keeping the sabbath is never undervalued it's a part of christian life it's part of christian experience but what's the purpose brethren of keeping the sabbath if our understanding if our learning if our if our uh, comprehension of the word of god will be so shallow then the sabbath keeping and the holiday keeping will become a great wonderful social events but we don't want to be a social club because the church of god is not a social club it can become one but no we are not going to allow it to become church of god is a school as one of my cousins here in serbia with a school for eternal life indeed so we better start behaving like school you know Last Sabbath, I think I told you about taking the notes. Taking notes, and and, and, and and that was a lovely, there was one lovely audio we got. What was it, from Tanzania, I think, or was it Uganda? No, it was Tanzania. A congregation that contacted us, they sent us how their services are held. And, you know, you had kids there drawing, in their drawing books, drawing something. You had adults taking notes. That's what we need to be doing. We need to start behaving like school because we're disciples of Jesus Christ. And we start better we better get out of this 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 self-righteous attitude that, that, that permeates this whole world. Oh, look how big we are. Because we serve God on the true day of rest. True, it's part of our life, but brethren, we still have so many things to do and so many things to unlearn. And so many things to restore to our understanding. 
just take a look at our our booklet for example on our booklet on how to when to seek anointed cloth and try to tell me that you understood it so perfectly well about that booklet you know all along before it came you didn't i'm sure so it's time for us to be humble to be humble people i don't want to see any pride and haughtiness i i, I detest that and thankfully, we are very thankfully we are very humble when it comes to our mutual relationships. We are there, and we understand that we are here to learn from one another. We are here to cooperate, and we are here, here to do teamwork. Teamwork, and you would think you would think that that would be something a Christian trait that would be shared by all these various groups of Christians. Oh no, sadly not. The body of Christ today, called the Church of God at large, I mean the largest community, is totally fractured because people were not willing to do teamwork. There was only, there was always one or one group that wanted to dominate, to be the leaders, to be the main ones, to be the top dogs and all of that. It will not be so among us because it says whoever wants to be a top dog has to be a slave to everybody else and has to serve others. Whoever wants to be the first has to be the last. And I think we all well understand that. And because we understand that, that's why God has been favorably looking upon us and using us, among others, various people all over the world, using us for his this entire work. And in fact, we're becoming a very good example to other churches of God and also a good example to the world at large. But part of our work and I cannot emphasize that enough, is that we have to, brethren, come to a deeper understanding of the simple doctrines of the Bible. And we have to understand, finally, that no, we're not just another of those churches out there. And no, we are not, uh, you know, we are not, we're not preaching the same stuff. We are not. We use the same book, yes, but we don't preach the wrong doctrines. The trap that we, many of us, had fallen into is uh, among these nominal Christian uh, religions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The big one churches now, now of course, uh, the rituals and, and, and superstition of this big church in Rome and big church in Constantinople. No, that's not really what the Bible teaches. Yes, we're clear with that. But we might have fall, we might have fallen into the trap of the Protestant, uh, brethren, Protestant theology, because Protestants keep pounding that we have to read the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. True, it's very positive, but the Protestants have not gone too much far from the Constantinople and Roman Church. They did not because they just stopped somewhere and they just uh, twisted the scripture to suit their own needs, wishes, wants, etc. And many of us, sadly, all over, not only us, but many of us have fallen into this trap Oh, these people advocate the Bible, so let's just hear what they're teaching. Yes, and as we ad as as we have been listening to their theology and doctrines, we have imbibed so many wrong things, or we got puzzled over certain subjects like Enoch and Elijah. But there is no reason to be confused because God is not the author of confusion. At least not God of Israel, God of the world. This world is the author of confusion. He just loves confusion. He, lo he loves to confuse you. Friends, if he cannot deceive you into wrong doctrines, he'll confuse you. He just revels in confusing people. We have to understand that. We have to be vigilant about that. If he cannot really deceive you, or he cannot deceive you about the Sabbath and the holidays, fine. But he can confuse you about Enoch, Elijah, and all kinds of things. And then we can just be keeping the right days and yet being confused about the true doctrines. Is that what we want? No. Is that what we are going to allow this, this world to do to us? No. No, no, and no. And the resurrections, the topic of the resurrections is part of all that overall confusion. You see, uh, we, we stopped reading the book of Jeremiah for a while so that we can just clear up the basic doctrines of the Bible. Because that's that is crucial because we can again we can keep the holidays and the sabbath all that we want and still be in confusion 
Is that what God wants? I'm sure that God of Israel is not pleased with that. And therefore, we're trying to please him now by clearing up all the major doctrines that we need to understand. So, the resurrections. You remember probably there are many of those whitewashed crosses standing over the seemingly endless graves of unknown soldiers who died in the great world wars of this of past century. And those words are usually engraved, here lies in glory and honor such and such, or a comrade in arms such and such, or known but to God lies here and so on. And certainly, brethren, no one, no one can read those words and look upon the graves of those fallen men without being sobered. Yet to those who understand the biblical doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, these same graves are a sure sign of the incredible power of the living God of Israel, who will one day make all these men stand upon their feet and live again. And that is the greatest hope, I would say, and the most certain hope that God has, and the most comforting hope, after all, that God of Israel has given to us and to all the believers, that death is not the end of the story. It's just a temporary state and that all those men and all humanity will stand and live again. All of our ancestors, all our loved ones, they'll stand and live together. That's the greatest comforting thought, you know, that we can have when somebody, some of our loved ones die or, or, or something happens. And to those of you who love your pets and animals, and I do understand that pets are also part of the family, don't worry. That even means for the pets. Yes, the pets are not included in the resurrection, certainly, but we can do something about it. Are you shocked? Well, why should you be shocked? If we're going to be perfect in everything when Jesus Christ comes and we come in the first resurrection, which means we'll just perfectly know the DNA of our pets. <laughs> what does that tell you? That tells us that we can compose their DNA and bring them back to life. Certainly. Yeah, sure. Why not? We'll be perfect like God. We'll be perfect like Jesus Christ. So there, therefore, we can just resurrect our loving, even our loving pets. Even that we can do, we will be able to do. So how much more will God, is God able to bring back to life all the humans that have ever died? After all, doesn't it say that Jesus Christ, but many, you know, people sometimes read the Bible and don't really make connections. Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So he had to be the first. He could have been Enoch and Elijah, certainly not. So you just have to, you know, when you sometimes when you contemplate teachings of this world, you have, just have to apply what you know from the Bible. And that's why sometimes memorizing scriptures is not even a bad idea. We had a whole program of memorizing scriptures and ambassador. You know, if God, if Jesus Christ is the firstborn among uh, among the firstborn from the dead, that means he has to be the firstborn. Which means that nobody who lived before him, like Enoch and Elijah and Moses and you name whoever you want, could not be the firstborn. It has to be him. And then you automatically understand that any wrong teachings about Enoch and Elijah in the Protestant world has to be false. Very often you hear me, I, what I encourage you always to do, brethren, I always encourage you, because I will tell you, don't be dummies. You know the Bible, apply it. Apply it to your understanding. Every time you have a dilemma, just first, the first thing you have to do, first thing to do, just stop and think what you know that is written in the Bible. And then use your common sense. If Jesus Christ is the firstborn, he is the firstborn. Nobody could be the firstborn before him. Nobody could go to third heaven before him. Nobody could ascend to heaven except for him who came down from heaven. And that's it. Common sense just tells you that there is no reason. You know, you wouldn't believe when you think about theologies of this world. There is so much, so great abysmal lack of common sense which contradicts that abysmal lack of common sense, contradicts the Word of God. The Word of God, which is our only authority for our lives. So, 
the basic doctrine of the resurrections. Briefly stated, the doctrine of the resurrection is the truth that the God who resurrected Jesus Christ will also raise to life again, or resurrect, all the dead. And you have heard me well, all the dead. For some, that resurrection will be to eternal life. For others, it will be to physical life with an opportunity for eternal life. That will be the second resurrection. And for some few, it will be a resurrection to the second death. And now you, you, you heard me saying three resurrections. Yes, indeed. The Bible teaches the three resurrections. Now somebody will say, oh, where does it say in the Bible? Why are you making things up? I'm not making anything up. I'm just inducing logically by using common sense. I'm inducing their three resurrections. The first one and the second one we know very clearly. They're well described to us in the Bible. But the third one is not. But think logically again. Those who committed unpardonable sin, those few, they cannot be in the first resurrection because it's, it's reserved only for the cold, chosen, and faithful to the end. All those who endure to the end will be saved. All right, so that's the first resurrection. Those people not only did not endure to the end, but they just gave up on God. Can they be in the first resurrection? The answer is no, they cannot. The second resurrection is for those who have never been really under, who have never really been called, who have never really understood the uh, uh, the Bible. These people who committed unpardonable sin are not in that category because they were called and they understood the Bible. And when you read Hebrews chapter six about those people, it says that they tasted already, they tasted the world to come, and they gave up on that. So can they be in the second resurrection like the all these? Men, women, children who are ignorant of, no, they cannot. So that leaves us with the third resurrection. They have to be in a separate resurrection that would lead them to second death. Well, in other words, they just, you know, rise, rise up to, 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 to life. Their sentence is read to them and they're just thrown into the lake of fire. That's it. So I'm not making anything up. I'm not, nobody's making anything up. The Church of God. The true church of God never makes things up. It only induces uh, 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 common sense. It only uses its common sense. It only, re only reads what's written in the Bible and then makes a logical conclusion out of that. Now, of course, the usual teachings of the world, it's a total chaos. It's a total chaos, as you know. The religionists of this world rarely address the doctrine of the resurrections, of course, because they don't understand it. The few who usually do, who just you know, address the doctrine of resurrection, they usually misunderstand either the time, purpose, nature, or numbers of the resurrections, you see. And I just summarized to you the numbers of the resurrections, you see. So now we know there are three resurrections, brethren. There is no there is no confusion about it. Because when you use your common sense, and when you use your common sense to rightly divide the word of God, and when you connect all that you know in the Bible, then you come to the inevitable conclusion. It has to be, yeah, we know about the two very clearly delane, delane, uh, very clearly outlined in the Bible. Some of the terminology in English is sometimes kind of interesting to pronounce and even most of you will not even understand it anyway most of the native speakers will not even understand it it's tr quite tragic when I see the native speakers and the terrible mistakes they make in English language one of the worst mistakes is are the plurals the plurals unbelievable unbelievable they, they, they mix up plurals with 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 uh, uh, possessive nouns you know and stuff like that I constantly have to <laughs> constantly have to correct that in our liturgy as well. But it's not your fault, brethren, it's the fault of your lovely worldly education system to which you can leave up your children to revel in it and become half literate or illiterate and get lost in the in the in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, labyrinth of, of, of confusion. Or you can just, you know, monitor their education and step in and just, uh, you know, 
have a corrective corrective power just you know tell them what's wrong in this world and then just tell them that this is not no this is not right no this is a bad english grammar this is good english grammar no this is a bad morality that the world teaches you this is the bible morality and so on so when it comes to the number of the resurrections i'm i, I i'm sure i hope that you have concluded there'll be three resurrections it might be shock to some some of you or some of our members no need for shock no need for shock god has given to his church the authority the power the mind the intelligence the sound mind to rightly divide divide the word of god some speaking of resurrection and the world some in a feeble attempt to reconcile the non-biblical doctrine of the immortal soul with the resurrection contrive a vague theory that the resurrection is not really a resurrection at all but merely a reuniting of the body and a of a deceased person with his immortal soul which had been liberated at death and has been living without the body ever since so in the orthodox world when people die uh, they have traveling across the vast expanses of heaven and uh, they pray you know the, the, the living pray that they would find the, 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 the refreshing place as they call it that, that that's the terminology used in the orthodox world and that god will give them um uh, how do they call it oh the, the the paradise paradise colonies paradise colonies in heaven Now nobody explains what is that refreshing place. What does that you know heavenly place in heaven? I, I haven't read in the Bible anywhere that there are heavenly places. There 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 are paradise places in heaven. But brethren, people just believe all kinds of non-biblical things, and of course, to be comforted because of their deceased ones, they have to concoct all kinds of contrive all kinds of ideas that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Nothing to do with God, the the the, the, the create Creator, and nothing to do with the Word of God, anyway. And you know, this and other theories, in no way are they supported by the Bible. But it's a good place to begin, you know, a study of this important subject. Because what is the Bible teaching? You see, the resurrection is one good proof that man does not have an immortal soul. You know, and you may wonder why haven't I been uh, underlining this immortal soul, immortal soul, immortal soul? Well, brethren, because it's the greatest deception from the Garden of Eden. What was the first lie of Satan? Think about it. The first lie of Satan to Eve. You have it there. The statement of of, of Satan to Eve was, "Oh God, did God did did God did God?" Well, he, first he comes with subtlety. You know, uh, did God say that you should? Did God, you know, he's actually subtly portraying God as something evil. In the first lie, he tells Eve, oh no, you will not, you will not die. Of course, they didn't die right away uh, when they ate the, true, the, the fruit of the wrong tree. But eventually they died. Because God said they would die if they do it and they died. But the first lie still lingers to this day in the minds of people. You know why people are so afraid of death, brethren? Do you ever have you ever do you ever think about it? Why are they afraid of death? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you because the Bible tells us. Because humans were created to live forever. And if they had chosen the tree of life you may call it eternal life, they, they would have continued to live forever and God will just work out the plan of salvation in some, some way, other way. But people were created to live forever. That's why they have this fear of death. And they're looking for the elixir of eternal life. They're looking uh, for, for, for means not to be aging. And, and they just have this fear of death. You know, it's the greatest fear in people. And the reason, well, there we are. And they come up with all kinds of ideas of why they would continue to live forever. So they came up with this beautiful, to them, idea of immortal soul. 
But that's the Satan, satanic lie from the very beginning. You will not die. Oh, but God is hiding from you some secret, you know, knowledge that you need to know. And once you know that, then you will, you know, a part of that secret knowledge would be, oh, you have immortal soul, which is immortal, meaning it cannot die. Meaning you have conquered the death without God, dear Adam and Eve. And then we wonder why do we have this new age ideology today, you know. Brethren, it all stems from that very first lie of Satan. You will not die. And humanity has been doing all along, has been trying not to die ever since, <laughs> has been trying to find a way to live forever. And yes, they found a way, of course, all without God. Yes, because that was not what God taught them. And here we have. So if man had an immortal soul, which today's religionist would say lives after death, why would the resurrection from the dead be needed in the first place? Is that a common is that a common sense question? Yes, it is. It is. But because there are resurrections, that means that man dies. All right, so then that automatically should tell us that all this new age today and all these all kinds of various religions and their ideas are totally wrong. They pale into insignificance, you know, uh, faced with the true teaching, teaching of the Bible. Now, numerous utterly dogmatic Bible statements promise the dead the hope of life again after death. And if you know that, if you know the Bible that well, if you know those promises, then you will not be confused, brethren. We have to start stop being confused. Not about not only about the resurrection, about everything when it comes to truthful and righteous Christian living. Because like I said, we have just imbibed too much of Protestantism and too much of this world. And we need to unlearn it now. Why should we be slaves to those errors? If we know the Bible, so always, every time, every time you have any doctrinal dilemma, whatever, even before asking, yeah, you can certainly you can ask ministry, and we can explain it to you. But even before that, all that you need to do is just stop and try to retrieve in your mind what does the Bible say, or go and Google, or or go and Google a certain subject, or go to the concordance. In, in the past, they they had concordances. Today, we don't even need we don't even need don't need concordances anymore. Google has it everything. You wouldn't believe what you will find on Google. You know, if you if you Google out King David, for example, oh boy, there he goes, whole biography of King David. With quotes from the scriptures still until I guess until they turn against God so much to, 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 to remove it. You Google out anything, you know, the fall, the first fall of Jerusalem, second fall of Jerusalem, there it is. With all the dates, historical dates, with all description of the events, and with all the Bible references to that particular event. It's absolutely amazing what God has given us. And sometimes when I hear people cry, oh, you know, we're so scattered, oh, we do this, this, and the other. Well, brethren, it's our fault. It's our fault because then it seems that we do not use the gift that God has given us, the IT sector, as they call it, or the Internet. You can, you can even search the Bible, study the Bible by using Internet, believe it or not. There is a program, eSword. You can download for free, which has concordances in, in Hebrew, in Greek. With It also has the uh, manuals about the uh, that speak about certain words, that describe certain events. We have no excuse. Only laziness or our willing ignorance, you know. And for years I've been, I've been, I've been, uh, and finally we're using that, thankfully. It seems that the hope of Israel had to appear to this world for us to start doing some things for years i've been i've been screaming in africa all, all all the time i said people there is internet you can use internet to the glory of god and you all pay for internet service so therefore 
you have even more responsibility to use internet to the glory of God. And finally, we started it. We finally start. We finally have a study group in Africa, from all over Africa. They cannot be all in the same place, brethren. They live in different countries. They live in different places, of course. But virtually speaking, they can be. Yes, virtually speaking, they can be in one place. They can be in one place, and then and 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 and, and uh, they can have they can hold Bible study uh, discussion discussions related to the to the scriptures, you know, Bible studies, even even the services. Why not? Who stops us from that? You know, but it's incredible. You know, people just so much used to not having like not having internet. Look, internet has made a revolution in our lives. Huge revolution. Internet has become something that is there to be used to the glory and honor of God. People use internet for all kinds of stupid things, of course. But we Christians, we Christians, we 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 should look for the opportunities and venues, you know, to glory God in everything. Whether you eat or drink, do you know, glorify God in everything you do. Fine. Using internet is our modern contemporary thing could using internet be to the glory and honor of god yes you, you sh be sure it can be because again i'm just afraid i'm just i'm just shocked sometimes how many people who want to serve god are ignorant of that or they just don't seem to grasp it why i don't know i don't really know because again you can download, you can find online all kinds of Bible tools and helps. But even on Google itself, you can find biblical history on Google itself. You just, you know, type type something into the uh, into the research box. Click enter. There you go. King Solomon. You can put King Solomon and, you know, or, I don't know, the separation of the kingdom of Israel from the kingdom of Judah. Wow, you wouldn't believe. It's all there in Google. With Bible references. So it really kind of kind of shocks me when people start, you know, whining and crying. Oh, we're so scattered. What a pity we did. Well, 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 well what makes us scattered? Oh, come on, friends. God gave us mind to think. God gave us creativity to use. So that's why we, 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 ever since we have been using this power of internet, here we are. Here we are right now serving God all over the world. Do you realize that? And look, we're all connected by internet. <laughs> and at the same time, we serve God, you know, in different places of the world. Why not? Didn't Jesus Christ say that we'll do even greater miracles than he did? Yeah, yes, he said that. We know that. Is this one of those miracles? I would say it is. Just think what the apostles could have done and achieved in their day and age if they had the internet. They didn't, but we do. And we continue in their footsteps when it comes to the doctrine and teaching. So fine. So fine. If you notice the Acts chapter 24, back to the topic of, well, back. I'm just making this. Yes, I have these, 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 these various comments because I'm trying to encourage you to think differently, brethren, to be different from the world in every sense, including how we use Internet. That we can use Internet for the glory and, 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 and honor of God. Now go to Acts chapter 24, verse 14 and 15, because now we are on the topic. We are on the topic of resurrection all this all, all along anyway. The words of the Apostle Paul in his defense before Felix, not my cat Felix, I have a cat Felix, no, this is a, <laughs> this was a governor. Acts chapter 24, 14. But this I confess to you that according to the way, which they call a sect, or you would call it today a cult in English, the way, now that's the, you see, why do you hear me say oh, was the way, the way, the way, in Hebrew, Haderek, the way, that's how the true religion was always called, the way, the way of life. But I would add the way of thinking, the way of direction, the way of common sense thinking, how we want to put it. So that according to the way, which they call sect, 
So I worship the God of my fathers, believing in all, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, in God of Israel, of course, which they themselves also is accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Acts chapter 24, verse 14 and 15. So to those who doubted that a resurrection for all would occur, Jesus Christ proclaimed in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation or no it's the wrong 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 word it's not the word condemnation in original in original greek it is judgment because the judgment is not what people usually think it is it's not passing on of condemnation to others judgment you know the process judicial process is a process so people, when they're resurrected in the second, they'll be judged, just like we are judged now in our lives as to what we do with what God has given us. So the people in the second resurrection, we have a period of time, 100 years to be judged. Before that, they'll have there'll be 1,000 years kingdom of God to restore the government of God over the earth and to establish God's power all over the earth, all over the nation, all over every nation. And then people will come into that prepared world they're going to come in the second resurrection and be judged, not condemned, but judged under the process of judging. They will be for quite some time. And quite some time would be 100 years, which is like, you know, speaking more or less one lifespan. So to determine and choose what they want to do with their lives, whether they want eternity or they just want to continue their errors in their wrong ways and so on. And further, even Old Testament writers like righteous Job and Daniel, they knew and spoke of the resurrection from the dead. If you take a look at the book at the book of Job, Job chapter 14. So Job understood it. But if Job understood it, then uh, that means that we ourselves have to understand it. Job chapter, did I say 14? That's right. Yes, I said 14. Job 14, look at verse 14. If a man dies... Shall he live again? All the days of my heart service I'll wait till my change comes. Yes, because brethren, the resurrection, being born again, truly born again, and the resurrection means that we have changed from this mortal passing mortal bodies to immortal bodies that can live forever, to glorified bodies, just like the one that Jesus Christ had when he rose from the dead. Uh, verse 15, you shall call and I'll answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. So Job understood about that. Uh, Daniel, I'm sure you know that Daniel chapter 12, that all of you know about Daniel chapter 12, because the uh, that's where we find that Daniel spoke of the resurrection from the dead. Chapter 12, verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So in addition to the wonderful promises of God himself, we also have an actual example we can look to as visible proof, positive that God can and will resurrect the dead. The example is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our elder brother. The fact of the resurrection is clearly shown from the biblical eyewitnesses records and informed testimony. And those records, of course, the apostles had those testimonies, including Apostle Paul. He wasn't among the uh, original 12 apostles. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, he speaks about the testimony he has heard from others, eyewitnesses, who told him about Jesus Christ and his resurrection to, 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 to life. Uh, Romans 1, 4, and, and being assembled together with, him, with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So, in other words, those who were disciples, those 120 disciples who were there in Jerusalem at the first New Testament Pentecost, those people testified to the Apostle Paul that Jesus Christ, after his death, 
was resurrected to life and then in the resurrected state he told them to wait not to go from Jerusalem but just to wait for the for this holiday to come and then they would be they would be uh, as strengthened by the strengthened by the Holy Spirit and they will be the witnesses of God to Judea and Samaria and to the rest to the ends of the earth and just like it is today it is brethren here we are from very ends of the earth all over the place and here we are now we're just being you know continuing the apostolic tradition the apostolic teachings and we are being witnesses all over the world um, also Peter he was one of the he was one of the uh, first Peter chapter 1 he was one of the 12 original apostles we have now Peter in uh, first Peter chapter 1 verse 3 Peter says as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and good and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue so he got Jesus Christ called them as they were fishermen he called them and uh, anyway Peter was a one of the witnesses one of the first-hand witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ but many have overlooked that while Christ's death pays for our sins nonetheless we shall be saved by his life. Brethren, that's piece of knowledge that we have to understand. It's in Romans 5.10. We shall be saved by his life. So his death, I just keep repeating that because people don't get it. Or they just, uh, nobody's there to teach them, but the church of God is here to teach them. All right. Jesus Christ died, so to pay the penalty of our past sins. Right, right. But he paid the penalty and that's it with his death. It stops there. For our eternal life, it was important, it was crucially important, he comes back from dead to uh, life. And so it happened, and that's what it says in Romans, we shall be saved by his life, not by his death. We are justified by his death. We are forgiven by his death. The penalty is paid, and it's no longer on us. But we are justified by his life, his eternal life, a life he is still living in us daily since his resurrection, which brought him back to life through the power of his Holy Spirit. He lives in us, Galatians 2.20. It's, it's no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ who lives in me. Further, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is incredibly important to us for another reason, brethren, for another reason. It proves, by example, that God can and will resurrect us. He did it to him. He is the firstborn among many brethren. And since Christ was resurrected, we can be too. He was not. He was not to be the only one resurrected, just the first. If you notice in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the famous chapter on resurrection, it says 1 Corinthians 15 verse 13 and 14. But if there is there if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also vain. Now goes verse twenty. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits, not only one obviously, but become the first fruits of them that sleep that slept or died. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made, did you read, realize that? All be made alive. If it is all, then it is all, brethren. If it's all people, it's all people. If it's, it's, it's you know, just like with the scattering of Israelites, Amos 9 9 has been overlooked by us for decades. If God said, I'll scatter the house of Israel into all the nations, then it is all the nations. By implication, all the races, because all the nations are not white or, or black or yellow or red. It's time for us to finally start to take the Bible at face value, use our common sense, and expand and broaden our understanding of certain things. The topic of the house of Israel is, is, is a crucial because the house of Israel is being used by God for, and will be used by God for salvation of all humanity. So the top, that topic has to be expanded. And various other topics have to be cleared up. 
that we have a clear vision because without vision isaiah chapter 8 says without vision people perish and hosea cries in his book my people perish for the lack of what brethren for the lack of faith well certainly they would perish for the lack of faith but no for the lack of knowledge how can we have faith after all if we don't have a proper knowledge how can we have a proper hope how can we be the hope of israel if you don't have proper hope and proper knowledge we need to have proper knowledge brethren to have faith to have vision because without vision, people perish. Oh, there are some who would love us to perish. Don't worry. And I've just, uh, I've received one of the one of the last messages. Yeah, sure. Some people tell me you should not be saying what is happening. Well, I, why should I not? There are bad examples that happen today, and I think people should be aware of that. Somebody from Africa, from Tanzania, wrote to me, thank you for opening my eyes. And he accused our, our minister in Africa, in Kenya, he accused our minister saying, you know, that he is the, uh, the, 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 the main scammer, the main whatever. <laughs> so I opened up his eyes because I accepted that minister and I just uh, appointed him and I did not let anybody waver me in my decision to have him to be our minister in Africa, in one of the African nations. And, uh, you know, I told him, you have a potential to become our representative of all of Africa. and uh, But that's God's, that's God's uh, decision, not mine. I'm just saying what I see. So this guy was, you know, when people don't get what they want, then they just uh, try to uh, accuse you and uh, discourage you and shake you in your conviction. So this guy tried to actually extract money from some of our members, and uh, it didn't work. Of course, I when I finally learned about it, I just said, out with him. And uh, obviously now he's unhappy that he's unhappy that his true colors have been revealed, and uh, he just wrote me that thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, oh, how righteous you! And then he said, I'm praying that I'm praying for you to get enter into the kingdom of God. I said to him, Don't pray, please. Prayers of people like you are abomination to God. Prayer of scammers, prayers of people who try to use others' friends, prayer of people who try to cause division is indeed abomination to God because there are six things that God hates in Proverbs, but the seventh one is the abomination in his eyes, and that is those who cause division among the brethren. Yes, we're all different. Yes, we all have differences. Yes, we're different. But yes, we are to also have a love, brotherly love for one another and respect and kindness. And we have tested that, if you want. We have tested it in, in practice. And here it is. The results are outstanding. The teamwork which brought us to so many successful stories and we all share in that success. And we all share in that blessing. And we all share in that brotherly love. That's what it should be. To me, that's the true Philadelphian governance for those who might be obsessed with Philadelphian governments. <laughs> Interesting enough, obsessed with Philadelphia governments are usually those who are just one-man show, you know. <laughs> so one-man show, you know, has audacity. To accuse us of not being Philadelphians and not having Philadelphian. Well, how do you know? We are experiencing Philadelphian governance in practice in a way that has been not experienced by many people anyway over the decades. You know, and uh, we will continue in that venue anyway. But when they cannot really, you know, when they cannot, they cannot subject you to your control or to do their will, like this man in Tanzania, then there was, oh, thank you for opening my eyes. Oh. And I'm praying for you to enter into the kingdom. No, don't pray for me to enter into the kingdom because your prayers are abomination to God. And I don't want, I don't need your prayers. And he's not the only one. There are people in Serbia doing exactly the same. Oh, we accusing me, you know, of, of some imagined misdeeds, of course. And then, oh, you know, we, we, we pray that you, I said, don't pray. Please don't pray. I don't need your prayers. I don't want your prayers because it's abomination. And rebellion against the against the, the government of God. After all, rebellion says it's equal to witchcraft. The same witchcraft being practiced today in Uganda and various other places all over the world. So it's abomination to God. No, I don't want to pray your prayers. 
you better pray that God would just lead you to repentance and and, 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 and to understanding how selfish, greedy, etc. you are. But no. It's amazing. Every time you catch people in those things, they would not they would always deny that. They would always blame somebody else. Somebody else is guilty for their for their trials, you know. It's not them themselves, no, it's somebody else. So this was a very malicious one, you know. Thank you for opening my eyes. I opened his eyes. Well, if I opened your eyes, if I really, truly did, if God used me to open your eyes, you'll be here. You'll be humble and you'll be in a teamwork. But obviously, since you're not, that shows that your eyes have been open. Just like, you know, Satan opened eyes to Eve. <laughs> Some others have got their eyes set. You know, it's not in vain and in Colossians. It says, set your eyes on things above. And, uh, you know, some people have set their eyes on the things below. And they follow the pursuits of the things below, of this temporary life. And, you know, and they expect certain blessing. And if they're blessed, of course, by God of this world, you know, to deceive others. And then they can just extract some use benefits for themselves if they don't succeed in that then they will just you know start speaking outright lies about us or uh, various accusations or be very uh, how shall i call it thank you for opening my eyes be very deceptive and so on be very negative ironic sarcastic and uh, and, and they think that it's going to work because, you know, their, their feelings are hurt. Their egos are hurt, you know. And they cannot live with that. So, even before they leave or whatever, they have to hurl certain insults against you just, you know, just to make themselves feel better and be comforted. But uh, that's sad. That's sad, but brethren, that we have seen that in the past several months. Uh, an amazing amount of that. And those people don't really realize how evil they are and how instrumental to the God of this world they have become. And so uh, that's their choice. Our choice, as far as I'm concerned, and our choice should be brotherly kindness, mutual cooperation, and the results are wonderful. Happy congregations, happy people. And then with those congregations and humble people, you can work and you can just clear up all the doctrinal confusion and you can just lead them and guide them to properly understand things and stay on the way. You see the way the Apostle Paul calls the right religion, the way, brethren. If you everybody asks you, how would you call your religion? Well, only one word, the way. That's what the apostles call it. That's how we can call it as well, the way. And so... Uh, We'll stay on that way, and hopefully, with God's blessings and guidance, that will guide us and lead us. That way should lead us to the uh, to eternal life. But also, you might remember the, the words of Jesus Christ, when he said that uh, narrow is the way <laughs> that leads to eternal life, but broad is the way, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and uh, there are many. There are many who go on that broad way, but we ourselves have we have chosen the narrow way. And it gets even more narrow when you think about how people in this world operate today. By their egos and self aggrandizement and all of that and uh, you know our way is even narrower. But we know that it leads to life and we know we know that not many go there. So there are those of you still who think that they will, will have who knows how many members all over the place. No, 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 no. Don't be deceived. Few are finding the narrow way. And that's it. That's it. It's, God, it's God's job to, to call them. Our job is to remain faithful to the way. And faithful to preaching the truth, brethren, and not compromising it with, with all kinds of Stupidity. Speaking of Enoch and Elijah, you know, it was a year ago, I think. There was, uh, in one of those major churches of God, there was a sermon about uh, Enoch, the book of Enoch, supposedly being part of the original original uh, Bible canon. And no longer, brethren, 
the book of Enoch, don't, do not be duped by this. The book of Enoch is a falsification. The original book of Enoch, yes, it's mentioned in the Bible, but the original book of Enoch has been lost. The one that we have today is a Gnostic falsification. And it's not the true book of Enoch. So you've been reading the book of Enoch, it's, it's even there out there on the internet. Just, 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 just don't waste your time. It's not the right book. The true, the, the, the original book was lost. We don't know where it is. We don't know what was in it. It is mentioned in the Bible. Yes, righteous Enoch, who's a true by the Apostle Jude. But anyway, the book of Enoch has been lost. And the current present book of so-called book of Enoch has nothing to do with the scriptures, with the, the Apostle Jude, with the apostolic faith. has nothing to do because it's Gnostic teaching. All right. So anyway, the last thing we read in Corinthians was, For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. If it's all, then it's all. So yes, the promise of the resurrection is indeed the very hope of all of us, since we are all only mortal and unless resurrected, we die and remain dead without hope of eternal life. That's why we call ourselves hope of Israel, because it's hope for eternal life, friends. Hope for eternal life for all the nations. That's why we named ourselves Hope of Israel. Nonetheless, the time and nature of this resurrection will not be the same for all. Because Paul stresses 1 Corinthians now 15 verse 22. We have said, for in, in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall be all made alive. But each one, he says in verse 23, each one in his own order. So the passage of scripture goes on to say that Christ was first Christ the first fruits in verse 23 and then afterward those who are Christ at his coming that's the first resurrection so hence we see again you see when you connect logically and by common sense all that you read in the Bible brethren there is no confusion we see that besides Christ the first group to be resurrected from the dead are those who are called and chosen of God exactly and according to Christ's words, those who endure to the end shall be in the future, not in the present, shall be saved. Romans 8, 9, we know, we have read it already, that those who are Christ, that is, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells as a result of repentance and proper baptism, those are Christ, Romans 8, 9. Those who do not have the Spirit of Christ are not His, meaning they are not even Christian. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16 speaks of the same time. Let's go to First Thessalonians and back it up what we are saying here. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Exactly, that's why we keep the Feast of Trumpets. It reminds us of the Lord's soon coming. And the dead in Christ, so those in Christ who are dead, but the, who had the Holy Spirit, that the Christ Jesus Christ had, those who had the Spirit and they are dead, they shall rise first. And then we who are alive, those who are still alive, with the Spirit of God and of Jesus Christ in themselves, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and we shall stay in the air. No, we will not. And then we shall always be with the Lord when we meet him. But we are not going to stay in the air because Zechariah 14 speaks about us. Descending down to the earth. To the, farm, uh, to the famous armed Megiddo. Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. Defeating those forces. And then, you know. And then his feet, Jesus Christ's feet, shall stand on the Mount of Olive. The Mount of Olive will cleave into two. And you know the rest of the the rest of the story you know and then in revelation chapter 20 verse 4 to 6 we have the confirmation of the same uh, event confirmation of the same event is there and uh, uh, we know that when jesus christ comes then those who are his will start will uh, uh, start to reign with him those who are resurrected then will be resurrected as spirit beings who cannot die, as we see in verse 6 in Revelation 20. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. 
those thousand years of course we know that refers to the what we call the millennium what we'll be doing in the millennium brethren we will be we'll be we're going to be restoring this whole earth it's going to be destroyed devastated by the wars by the nuclear wars by uh, poisons by you name it we have to clean it up we have to restore it we have to remove the seas will be removed why will the seas be removed? because the vast earth territory is needed for what for the billions of people who will come up in the second resurrection brethren so far we have about eight billion people in this world i think is it eight or is it even more but whatever but you know just think how many how many more billions uh, many of those billions now many will die in the coming in this coming events we just think now how many more billions are going to come up in the second resurrection brethren where are they going to live well they're going to live they're going to live obviously that on this renewed earth that will be renewing in the 1000 years clean up renewed expanded so the people could live that's why the seas will be no there because the bottom of the sea is the ground is the ground that could be used for living dwelling it's rich in oil it's rich with in minerals it's very fertile soil you see now do you understand why that's why the, 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 the you know the seas will no longer be there the oceans as well so when, when, when we have that removed it's a vast territory being prepared for who well for people to come up in the second resurrection brethren and this first resurrection we read about in Revelation and 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is not the only resurrection because verse, verses 5 and 6 refer specifically to the resurrection as the first resurrection. But verse 5 tells us the next, the second general resurrection will occur in God's plan. It says, verse um, 5, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years, the millennium, were finished. Exactly. We're going to restore the earth and prepare it for the billions of people to come up in the second resurrection. Brethren, is that a vision that you have? If you don't, please have that vision, because without vision, people perish. And this second resurrection will be of those who have lived and died and, for one reason or another, have not had a chance for salvation. And God is being just God, and God is not going to say, oh, God is using, you don't, many of you do not understand that God is using Satan today. Satan, <laughs> I know this, this sounds uh, absurd, but Satan is in service to God, because Satan, the work of Satan today, brethren, is to deceive the whole world, to deceive, and he is doing it very successfully. However, Satan will be removed, of course, but he is still you know, being used by God in a sense. His work today is to deceive, and that's his work, and that there's nothing we can do about it other than resist him in our life, and he'll flee from us, says the book of James. But he's deceiving people, and they cannot have a chance for salvation. Once he's removed, and once, you know, the government of God is restored all over the earth, we'll be able to teach all humanity the way, the way, which they call the sect, we will be able to teach them the way to salvation, brethren. And that's why we will, you know, those little pieces of knowledge we need to have as part of our understanding, as part of our beings, brethren, because only then we will not be deceived and we will not be tossed to and fro by these all kinds of religious ideas that we hear in this world. <coughs> or to be torn apart with worry. Oh, my relatives are not converted now. Oh, oh my friends are not following the way. Oh, they're all going to... No, they're not going to perish. It's not their time. The time of their judgment will be when Christ comes, those who will remain alive, or when they come up in the general second resurrection. Friends, let's just clear up our minds and not, not, not be slaves. <coughs> let's not be slaves to the ideas of this world. Or to the ideas of our human nature. <laughs> oh, my brother is not... Well, you know, requests I would receive sometimes from people. Oh, please pray that my brother becomes a Christian. Oh, please. No, I'm not going to pray for that. God has chosen you and me because he has seen qualities that we have to endure to the end. Yes, God can make, you know, your brothers, your sisters, Christians, and your brothers and sisters may not have the qualities of personality to endure to the end, meaning that they will just be lost. Is that what we want? No, that we don't want. 
leave up God, you know, who God is going to call. And he usually calls people who we don't even consider our friends or close to us or equal to us or whatever. He calls up totally different people from us. But those people that he wants to see in his kingdom, those people that he knows. You know, so there's this prayer, oh please, you know, I had those prayers, but I'm realizing how wrong it is, friends. They're nice, yes, it's a good will, but it's a wrong thing to ask because because we don't even know what kind of dangers we might just uh, we might just get our relatives, loved ones, our friends into by that kind of thing. They may not be the type of persons to endure to the end. And that means they won't make it into the kingdom. They won't make it for the eternal life. Leave go calling. Leave it up to God. And don't think about it. Don't worry about it. Because this is not a time that God is saving the whole world. God can save the world without us. If he wants to save the world, he will have saved it. But if he didn't save it, that means he has a plan. He called those whom he wanted to call. We are here. We who are in the ministry, we are here to serve those being called. And those people being called are very, 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 very much different from us. And God called them, obviously, because he has got some job for them in the kingdom of God. So why should we be worried about that? But, you know, sometimes our nature, sometimes our worries, sometimes our goodwill, you know, get in the way of reasonable thinking and knowledge of the Bible and just messes all up. There's one saying, I think, that the, the way to hell is paved with goodwill or good wishes. And yes, it's true. We think it's goodwill, good wishes, and sometimes we just get into the... We, 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 we simply get into the way that God God has to clear certain things. And you know, all of this, all these cries, Oh, poor, or this, let's help this. Brethren, we cannot help the whole world, number one. And number two, it's not the time for that. Do we get it? Do we get it? It's not the time to help the whole world because we are help, going to help the whole world once we become the government of God. And once we become rulership, ruling government of God on the earth. We cannot, in the meantime, we cannot help all the world even if we wish. The world has to experience suffering because people, usually humans through suffering, learn their lessons, you see. If you ask me, I would very, very much, I would very gladly, I would very gladly try to, to not to see the great suffering of the Israel after flesh today, of the American Britain and, and, and Australia and New Zealand. It hurts me, but there is nothing I can do about it because through that suffering, it's a corrective punishment that God has determined. And that's it. There's no way we can say, well, the same goes for the rest of the world. Oh, orphans or widows. Oh, yes, true, brethren, because through those sufferings, those people don't only have to learn the lesson, but through the sufferings, they have to make a difference one day. When they come in the second resurrection under the government of God, they'll be able to compare being under the government of humans and the government of God, under the government of Satan and the government of God. They'll be able to compare that and then make the right choice. So even though there's so much suffering in this present world, brethren, we cannot do much about it. We cannot. It's not our time, and therefore we should not, please do not try to refrain from uh, worrying yourselves too much about sufferings of your nations or trying to, 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 to tell me, oh, we, what shall we do about that? No, there's nothing we can do about it. I see the suffering of my nation all over the place. Economic depression for decades, not years, decades. But there's nothing I can do about it. It's not my time. And do you ever hear me saying about the widows, orphans, and all that? We've got plenty of those. And all this current suffering that we are seeing in Europe, between in Russia and Ukraine, yes, it's horrible. Hurts me, but there's nothing I can do about it because this is the world of Satan. Now that we cannot do, we cannot alleviate. We can here and there, we can do something what we can do, we will, but we cannot, you know, you, you are going to torn yourself apart for, you know, we, we, we cannot save this, we cannot do this. No, we cannot. It's not our time. And because it's not our time, we better just be, 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 be at peace with ourselves. It's nothing we can do, it's nothing we have caused, it's nothing we can do to solve it because it's not our time. The time will come. Just be patient. In the meantime, yes, you'll be seeing people suffering, I know. 
But they obviously have to go through that suffering. Obviously, God has determined why. Well, then one day they'll be comparing their suffering to the life under the government of God. Which should greatly influence their right decision to make the decision. Oh, the government of God, really. This is what really is the real life. Well, fine. I want to live forever like this. So I want the government of God. I don't want any more the human governments and stuff. Friends, we have to understand that. That's reality. Yes, of course, we are compassionate and we feel for the suffering of the people, but there's nothing we can do too much about it. What we can do, we will, indeed. But what we cannot, there is no way we can help all the orphans in, of Africa and all the orphans of Serbia and all the orphans of East Europe and all the orphans of Ukraine and all the widows of Russia and so brethren. It's impossible. And it's not our time. So we better stop worrying about that. We better start rejoicing over the fact that the time is coming when we will be able to help all of them. And their experience is going to help them make the right choice. That's what it is. And I'm saying that because, you know, I'm just a bit, I'm getting very tired and very weary about some people having idea that the Church of God is here to help the world make a better place to live. Brethren, no. Or, you know, pray for the peace of the world. There will be no peace in the world because the world is not God's world. There will be no peace in this world. And, you know, there will be no really happiness, true happiness even if we help all the orphans, they'll just squander that money on some unimportant things. <laughs> you know. And widows and stuff. Why? Well, because the human nature is like that. Human nature is attuned to the spirit of Satan, brethren. He is the prince of the air. He just permeates the whole, uh, uh, the whole atmosphere. And we cannot do nothing that, you know, to stop the suffering of people, no matter how. In some cases, we probably could, but there's nothing much we can do. And it's not our time. That's the point. The hope of Israel, the hope that we have is that the time is coming when we'll be able to help the whole world. In the meantime, they're having bad experiences, but their bad experiences are going to help them make the right choice one day. You know. So, one way or the other, again, Satan is in service to God with all the deception he's doing. Because one day, people when their eyes are open will be able to compare how it is to live under Satan and how it is to live under God. And we have to put those things into perspective, including orphans and widows and sufferings and all of that, for the sake of our peace of mind. It's all just temporary, and it all just serves a good purpose. And it's God's, obviously it's God's will, so we better don't meddle into God's will, because then we will be trying to subvert what God has planned. Obviously, in the second resurrection, the rest of the dead, when they will come up, this group comprises of a comprises the bulk of humanity, for only relatively few have ever heard the name of Jesus. Many of them have not, let alone truly received God's Holy Spirit, let alone ever understood the true gospel message. Therefore, brethren, the, this resurrection, the second one, is not of the Spirit to eternal life. These, of course, have not yet qualified for God's kingdom, but it is it will be, be a resurrection to a physical life with finally a chance to learn of God's truth and qualify for his kingdom and that's exactly our uh, our our condition right now we are now in this life we live in this physical life we have a chance to learn God's truth and qualify for his kingdom and that's it and if you know the proof verses 11 and 12 of revelation 20 which find the rest of the dead at the time after the millennium resurrected before God not to be condemned but to have the word of God open to their understanding so they can learn of God and qualify for his kingdom. And this is the second resurrection indeed. And the second resurrection is spoken of more fully, as I said, in Ezekiel chapter 37. Somebody quoted today, uh, somebody wished us happy Sabbath and quoted Ezekiel chapter 37. Indeed, there will be an everlasting covenant with uh, peace covenant with, with Israel and the rest of the world. Yes, indeed. And keep in mind that all the nations will have to be grafted into Israel, meaning all the races will be grafted into Israel. And I don't care who care who hates the truth about Israel. I don't care who, who just maligns the truth about Israel. I don't care who, who accuses us of being racist. Those people are just dumb, ignorant. 
and they don't they don't know their Bible. And we are cope of Israel because we know our Bibles. And plus, we added Worldwide Church of God because we're continuity of the Church of God that was true Philadelphia work of the last century, and we want to emulate that and follow that in every possible way. So, in Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12, you see that the Word of God will be open to those people, and they can learn God of God, and they can qualify for His kingdom. That's the second resurrection. The second resurrection, more fully, if you want to see it, it's on the example of resurrection of all Israel in Ezekiel 37, where the physical nature of the resurrection is clearly seen, because, you know, all the bones, that's the value of the dry bones, and Ezekiel, can they can they bones alive? And Ezekiel says, well, God, Lord, only you know. And then those bones start to shackle, and there was a great noise, and all the bones come together. They become joints, there are sinews on them, and they become living physical people, brethren. So the physical nature of this second resurrection is clearly seen, and where it is evident that the resurrected ones will finally know God. And finally, the Bible speaks of yet one more resurrection for the group not dealt with in either of the other two, which I mentioned to you at the beginning of this message, and this is the third resurrection. So now, so for those who say, oh, where do you read that in the Bible? Well, you read that in the Bible from, uh, uh, from, uh, from these two resurrections, and who qualifies for each, and then you just infer, and you just make a logical conclusion. Because th this group of people is not covered by either of the resurrections, brethren. As clear as that. And that's why we call that, for, for the lack of better term, the third resurrection anyway. You know, it is a resurrection to the second death, since those resurrected will be cast into the lake of fire and burned up. Daniel spoke, and we read uh, Daniel 12 verse 2, and he said that some would be resurrected to life, and some to, he says, shame. Christ also speaks of this resurrection in John 5:29. He calls it the resurrection of condemnation, not judgment. The second resurrection is the resurrection to judgment, to a period of time. To the period of time when people will be able to make the right decision. And the second, but this resurrection is the resurrection of condemnation. Revelation 12, 20 verse 14 says this. Read Revelation 20, 14. Then death and Hades, Hades mean grave in Hebrew. Death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death, brethren, is actually a type of mercy killing, if you wish. Because those who die in the lake of fire, because of the twisted thinking that led them to become worthy of such a fate, in the first place, would, if given eternal life, live out immortality in misery. Could you imagine people who just, you know, misery seeks company. There is a very apt saying in English. I've, I've, I've this year, this calendar, past calendar year, I've, I've felt that that misery seeks company. When you see one miserable person, and then it just seeks company like a bad apple, then it just 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 just, just, just broadcasts its toxins to others. And then more people become bad apples, and there it is. Misery seeks company. Can you imagine those miserable people, people living forever in misery? Or oh, what kind of merciful God would that be? So yes, in these three resurrections are contained the hope, <laughs> the hope of Israel, you would say. Yes, the hope of Israel. But the hope of Israel, friends, is the hope of all humanity. Because all humanity will have to be grafted into Israel. That's a big mystery Paul explains to us in Romans 11 and there is no reason for us to feel oh we are not Israelites who is we will you will be even if you're not yeah you're you're because once you turn to the God of Israel and keep his laws you become automatically Israelite what else could you be because no none of those laws is part of our national legislation so no longer we are Serbs or Chinese or or Kenyans or this that and the other we are we become Israelites led by the Spirit of God, indeed. But even our nation, even our physical nations eventually will have to be grafted into Israel. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with, you know, there is nothing wrong with, 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 with the doctrine of, the, of, the, of Israel. It encompasses all humanity. It's so beautiful. It's such a perfect plan that only all-wise, almighty God could have come up with. 
So in these three resurrections are contained the hope of all humanity. That hope is the promise of life after death in the resurrection from the dead. Uh, if you didn't take notes, I would encourage you to start taking notes. Before conclusion, let me just give you the key verses, because with any doctrinal subject such as this one, it's good to remember or even mark in your Bible the most important scriptures on a subject. And here is some. John 5, verse 28 and 29, and Acts chapter 24, 14 and 15. Both Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul predicted the resurrections. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. To 24, since Christ was resurrected, we will also be. First Thessalonians 4 16, Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6, the first resurrection is explained. Revelation 20, verse 5 and 6, and, uh, and verse 12. Ezekiel 37, verse, well, you can, the verses 1 through 14, they speak about the second resurrection, is described in all of these passages. And then the third resurrection, Revelation 20, verse 13 through 14, and John 5. 29, the third resurrection is described. In conclusion, brethren, yes, to some, those who died over the years, like the fallen soldiers that I mentioned at the beginning, may indeed be unknown, or though perhaps known, unremembered. But God knows them and will not forget them and will not forget anybody. For them, for to them and to all of us mortals who know we shall die, but know not the hour, God offers the blessed hope we may all long for the resurrection of the dead to life again with the hope of eternal glory. Meaning the hope of eternal life and that will be, that's indeed the hope of all humanity, that's indeed the hope of Israel. 